Good morning. So good to see y'all. <laughs> Enjoying this long weekend. Let's spend some time with the Lord. Amen. Come all you weary. Come all you thirsty. Come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water. Come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners. Come find his mercy. Come to the table he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness. Find what you're looking for. For God so loved the world that he gave us. His one and only son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. Thank you for that, Lord. waiting there with open arms Caesar Sing that with me. Praise God. Lift your voice. Praise God. Sing it out. From whom all blessings flow. together. Bring all your failures. Bring all your failures. Bring your addictions. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting. God so loved the world. Lord Jesus, we come to you in all of our brokenness, in all of our need knowing that what we need for wholeness rests in the power of your name. There's a name that levels mountains, carves out highways through the seas, and I've seen its power unravel battles right in front of me. Thank you, Jesus. 
There's a faith that stands to find Sends Goliath to his knees And I've seen his praise unravel shackles Right off my feet That's the power that's in That's the power of your name Just the mention makes the way Giants fall and strongholds break And there is healing That's the power that I claim It's the same that broke the grave There's no power like the mighty name of Jesus Oh, there's no power like your name There's a hope that calls out courage And in the furnace unafraid That kind of daring expectation That every prayer I pray Is on an empty grave That's the power, that's the power of your name Just a mention Giants fall, the strongholds break, and there is healing. That's the power that I claim. It's the same that rolled the grave. There's no power like the mighty name of Jesus. There's no power like the mighty name of Jesus. The power like you need. Every knee will bow, every tongue confess. There's no power like your name. I see you taking ground. Oh, I see you press again. Your power is dangerous to the enemy's king. You still do miracles. Say right to him, and you will do what you say. You're the same God now as you always been. Sing it out! Your spirit breaking down, your kingdom moving in, your victory claims the crown that the enemy had. You still do miracles, you will do what you say. been my refuge, a place of safety when I am in distress. Oh, my strength, to you I sing praises, for you, oh God, are my refuge, the God who shows me unfailing love. Dear Lord God, we just welcome your presence, Holy Spirit, in this place today. Thank you for being our strength, our, our fortress, our deliverer. Lord God, today, draw us near to you. Renew our mind, renew our strength, renew a right spirit within us. God, we just pray that the power of your Holy Spirit will overflow out of us, into our families, into our towns, into our world. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning. 
My name is Marian Gaiman. I am the Director of Local Outreach here at Hopewell. I want to just, uh, first of all, begin by saying thank you so much for coming today. Um, we are going to be continuing our worship at the end of the service, so we just look forward to uh, continuing to worship that way. Uh, we want to welcome our online viewers and our guests today. Thank you so much for coming today. I have uh, uh, good news for you. Since it is the beginning of the month, we have, along with our uh, coffee and tea and water, we have some pastries for you as well. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, we wanted to say, uh, uh, giving you all a chance to meet and greet. So while you're back there enjoying uh, your, your uh, treats, beverages, and, and uh, pastries, and you're meeting someone new today, we challenge you to do that. Uh, we have a meet and greet question for you, and that is, if you could choose any occupation now or in the past, what would you do? What would you be? So um, on that note, uh, we're going to dismiss you to go meet and greet someone new and welcome some new people and we'll see you back in a few minutes. Wonderful. 
All righty. Well, once again, we want to welcome guests. If you received a bulletin, at the bottom of the bulletin, there is a place for you to put information. You can drop that off at the Welcome Center on your way out and uh, receive a free gift to welcome you today. We're so glad that you have joined us today at Hopewell. Uh, if you have any prayer requests, there's a place on the bulletin for you to list those as well and hand that in at the Welcome Center on your way out. Um, just a, a brief recap, last Sunday, many of you know, we partnered with Miller Keystone Blood Center and we had a blood drive here at church. And uh, the good news is that the blood that we collected, I got a report from Miller Keystone Blood Center, it will save 111 lives in our local community. So, good news. Thank you, thank you, thank you for those who participated. And if you didn't, maybe next time. Um, so, in three weeks from today, we have our church picnic, September 25th. We're so looking forward to that. And we need volunteers. So, if you are available that Sunday and you would like to volunteer, we would welcome your help. There's a place online that you can go to events on our church uh, website, events, scroll down, find church picnic. There's a form you can fill out. Uh, there will also be a form available in the lobby next Sunday for you to sign up and help. So we'd appreciate that. Now, the picnic is one way for you to help and connect on one day, and we would appreciate that. But, but one way that Hopewell really wants to establish some connection and community on, in an ongoing way is for you to sign up it, to, in a life group. Uh, some of you already est are established in life groups, and that's wonderful. We have some new life groups available. Maybe you saw the signups out in the lobby. They're going to be available this week and next week. So we encourage you, go look, sign up, find a life group that would be suitable to you, your needs. Uh, that uh, a lot of the life group leaders have been praying about it. They're excited to begin, and a lot of them will be beginning their life groups the last week in September and the first week in October. If there's a life group that just doesn't seem like it may fit you, there is a sign up for you too. <laughs> just sign up separately, and uh, Tyler, hers, is going to be in the lobby afterwards. He will answer any questions you may have. So looking forward to connecting you all that way. I am now going to be turning things over to Pastor Gary. All right, this time I'm going to invite Nick Kohler and whoever, if anybody else come with you, I'm not sure, but uh, we're going to be licensing Nick Kohler this morning as our youth pastor, so the elders are going to be coming up, and uh, we will be praying and commissioning and licensing Nick. So if you guys want to stand over here a little bit, maybe Nick and your family can stand over here. So this is Nick and his wife, Melissa, and their children. All right. So Nick, the call of pastoring is twofold. First, God calls us by his spirit, and then we respond to that call. Second, the church recognizes that call and gives its affirmation through the licensing process. And so today, we publicly affirm God's call in your life to pastor the youth of this church. Pastoring is a high and holy calling, and an awesome responsibility, and we are entrusting that role to you. Serve Christ and his church in the fear of God and the power and the joy of the Holy Spirit. And so with these vows that we're about to do and the laying on of our hands, we credential you and we impart to you the spiritual authority and blessing to carry out your ministry as a servant leader. So I'm going to read the vows to you, and then afterwards, at the end, you will say, I do. So Nick, do you purpose in your heart to uphold God's word before this congregation and in your life as inspired of God and authoritative in all matters of life and conduct? Do you purpose to faithfully fulfill the responsibilities of youth pastor to this fellowship, which includes teaching the whole counsel of God, equipping the saints, leading by example, admonishing, encouraging, discipling, protecting, and praying for the church as a servant leader? And for this pastoral assignment, do you commit yourself to Hopewell Church in a spirit of mutual accountability and support? I do. Let's lay hands on him then. We hereby license you, Nick, and delegate to you the authority to carry forth your ministry with our blessing and affirmation. We ask the Lord to grant you the gifting and anointing to fulfill your ministry in the power and love of the Holy Spirit. 
And Father, we as a church, we just collectively pray that you would bless him, that you would guard his mind, his thoughts in Christ Jesus, that you would fill him with every confidence that he needs, not because of talents or abilities, but because of your calling and that he is your son. Lord, we bless him, Lord. We, we stand with him. We encourage him, Lord. We thank you in advance right now for the, the connections that he will make, the lives that he will affect. And we pray that you would lead him by your Holy Spirit to speak about the things that our youth need to hear and that you would just bless that ministry from top to bottom, Lord. We give you praise and thanks, Lord. You are a good God. And I pray that you would just bring a... a, a blessing of protection over him and his family, that they would feel uh, guarded by you, Lord, that they would feel blessed and strengthened by you through every season, up and down, Lord, that they would know that they are in your hands. Thank you, Jesus, that you promised to walk with us even to the end of the age, that you were always with us. So bless them right now, and we thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Congratulations. Turning back to announcements, if um, you are prepared to give this morning, we say thank you so much. We are always so grateful for both the gift and the giver, for your heart in blessing our church and our ministries, both locally and globally. Uh, we have a different, couple different ways for you to do that. Uh, one via our website or our app. Um, another, we have boxes in the back. You can just drop that off on your way out. We would, again, just are so grateful for that. Also, uh, it is that time, if you are in fifth or sixth grade, for you to stand up, be dismissed. We have teachers who are prepared and ready to, to bless you today. So there they go. All righty, we'll see you later. All righty, so at this time, if you would just turn your attention to the screens for the rest of the video announcements, have a blessed day. Good morning, Hopewell. Welcome to September. We have a lot coming up this fall. The Belong class is an in-depth look at Hopewell. You will learn what we believe, how you can partner with us, and find out where you can serve. This is a deep dive with Pastor Wayne. It is also the path to church membership. Childcare is available. You can register online today. For more information, contact Pastor Wayne. Women are invited to attend this fun one-day fall retreat right here at Hopewell. There will be breakout sessions, worship, and a guest speaker meant to encourage your faith to grow. It will be a fun day featuring fellowship, a catered lunch, and crafts. Register online by the end of the month. If you would like to know what else is coming up at Hopewell, like next week's technology workshop, the return of the Well Ministry, the return of our Moms Ministry, or our Seniors Luncheon, check out your bulletin or visit hopewellchurch.org. And remember, live well, love well, hope well. All right, good morning again. Um, you know, as, as often the case is that people often ask me, like, what, what are your, what's your favorite thing about being a pastor? And invariably, one of them is the, the privilege and honor of getting to, to preach because what it does for me is that I have to dig in deeply to God's word. And uh, I don't always get to pull back the curtain, but, you know, God was just doing a, a deep, deep work in my own heart this week. And uh, as often happens, I have to preach to myself before I can preach to you. And so the Lord was definitely convicting me. And, uh, you know, to me, it's, it, conviction is one of those things where I don't want us collectively, me, you, together, those of you watching online, I don't want us to enter into this space and time together uh, leaving the same way that we came into it, if that makes sense. Because otherwise, all, all we're doing is we're getting information instead of transformation, and so my, my hope and heart today is that as we've been going through this series that we're in right now, which is called, Is It Hot in Here?, um, that we will enter into this time and space and we'll leave it different than the way that we came in. Because, and I know that convicting messages aren't always like the most fun. We don't laugh as much. But, but this is the heart. When God's Holy Spirit gets in there, this is the purpose of his word, is that it, it penetrates light and darkness and it kind of set, separates things. And it, it gets us where God wants us. And when you are where God wants you, you're going to find that your life is filled so, with so much more peace, with power, 
and you'll, you'll be glad that you have gone through that transformation process. Now, last week, um, we, as we've been going through the series, we've been talking about some of the hot-button topics in our culture. Um, last week, we talked about deconstructionism, which is what happens when we don't address the hot-button topics of, that, of our culture. So I encourage you, and I know it's, it's, we're kind of at the end of summer, and this is still a big travel weekend for our church family, that if you've ever missed any of these messages, to please go back and, and listen to them as we they hopefully will paint a complete picture for you on our, you can listen to our church app or watch it. But uh, today, though, we have another topic that's not necessarily one that we love to talk about at the dinner table or around the breakfast table, um, but that topic is the topic of adultery. Now, not the adultery between a man and a woman, but adultery between us and God, spiritual adultery. Jeremiah 3.6 says this, The Lord said to me, Have you seen what fickle Israel has done? Like a wife who commits adultery, Israel has worshipped other gods on every hill and under every green tree. In other words, wherever Israel could find a god, oh, let's worship that one. And to the Lord, that was like adultery. God did not just see the Israelites as people that he loved, but also as people with whom he made a, a vow and a covenant. It was a covenant relationship between God and Israel. And so when Israel gave themselves to other gods, it was like in, it, God was making the comparison of somebody in a marriage giving themselves to someone else. It was spiritual adultery. So Israel and, and, and God were, were promised to each other, but they're worshiping other gods. But now, of course, it, the church has not replaced Israel, but the church is now referred to as the bride of Christ. And so what happens when we do the same thing? Because God is now in a new covenant with us. When we give ourselves over to other gods, we are then committing spiritual adultery. And here's the key, is that idolatry is adultery. There's no way around that. That's, that's what the scriptures tell us very, very clearly. And any time that something or someone takes our love and affection away from God and it gives it to something else, that's idolatry. Even, I've said it before, it's when sometimes even a good thing becomes a God thing in our lives. That's idolatry. What's amazing, though, is that a lot of the gods that were worshipped in the Old Testament, like the actual gods that we would talk about, are in many ways the same gods that are being worshipped today. They might just have different names. The same gods for thousands and thousands of years are still being worshipped today. Now, I believe that this topic is one of those, the most important topics uh, that the church needs to hear today. Again, it's not necessarily fun, but it's absolutely important and transformational for us. What we're going to do is we're going to look through... 1 Kings, much of 1 Kings chapter 18 is kind of the basis for where we're going to hang out today. If you have your Bibles, there's some in the seats in front of you. You're welcome to turn there if you want to. If you want to look in there, or we'll have them scriptures on the screen as well. But we're going to go through this passage, uh, and it's the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And, but we're also going to jump around to some different scriptures as well as we go through that and see what the Lord is saying to us. Now, to give you a little bit of background and context, um, Elijah is a prophet in Israel and the king, his name is Ahab, he's a terrible king. In fact, the, the scriptures tell us that he was basically the worst king that Israel had had to that point. And he also has an a, a equally or more so evil wife named Jezebel. And she's out there trying to kill the prophets of the Lord. And Elijah's uh, either the only one left or one of the only ones left. So Elijah approaches Ahab, this evil king of Israel, and he confronts him with a plan. So we're going to pick up on, in chapter 18, verse 17. It says, when Ahab saw Elijah, he exclaimed, So is it really you, you troublemaker of Israel? I have made no trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. You and your family are the troublemakers, for you have refused to obey the commands of the Lord and have worshipped the images of Baal instead. Now, I want to focus for a second here on these two words, the commands of the Lord and you have worshipped the images of Baal instead. Who is the Lord and who is Baal? Now, really quickly, who the Lord, this is the Hebrew word Yahweh. So whenever you see it in your Bibles, capital L-O-R-D, that actually is the Hebrew word Yahweh. It's God's name. And so they, they just, uh, when you go to how and why, they did all that. But, but that when you see capital L-O-R-D, you're saying God's name. And then Baal, Baal is a Canaanite god of fertility, reproduction, the sun, and the weather. So Baal was the one, think about this, Baal was the one that you would pray to if you wanted to get pregnant or did not want to get pregnant. So in a sense, he was the god of, of reproduction. And, uh, and so we may not worship the god of reproduction anymore, but we hold the power now to reproduction, don't we? 
In many ways, we've made gods of ourselves in this area. We want to be able to control when we do or do not have a baby. In other words, see, the spirit behind all this is the same thing. Baal worship also included the killing of babies. And in the scriptures, we even see examples of Israelite kings, Israelite kings who gave themselves over to Baal, and Israelite kings were, were sacrificing babies. Because Baal was also the god of the weather, that means he was seen as the god of prosperity. Because in that ancient culture, if the weather was good, then the land was prosperous, and everyone had money and wealth, and there was exchange. And so is prosperity one of those things that our nation worships today? Absolutely. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more about Baal later on. Verse 19. Now summon all Israel to me at Mount Carmel, along with the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, who are supported by Jezebel. So Ahab summoned all the people of Israel and the prophets to Mount Carmel. Now, how many people of Israel did he summon? All. So this is an entire nation he's invited. Now, I don't know if this was invited or he made come, but basically all of Israel is coming to Mount Carmel. Now, what was Mount Carmel? We have a picture I want to show you of, of Mount Carmel. This is actually Mount Carmel today. It probably hasn't changed a whole lot, but you can see, like, it's, it's like, almost, like, laid out. It's this ideal situation or place where you can almost see, like, this big showdown taking place. And all of Israel was on this mountain. Sometimes seeing these pictures helps us ground these stories in reality, doesn't it? Like, this is, this is a real place. And, uh, but what's interesting is that what Elijah's doing here is that he's, he's saying, he's basically saying to the prophets of Baal, we're going to, this was, because this was seen as Baal's mountain. And so he's saying, we're going to do an away game here. We're going to play an away game. I'm going to go to your territory. You get the home fans. You, 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 you can do whatever you want to on this mountain, because this is, this is Baal's mountain, supposedly. And, uh, and so he tells him to bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 uh, Asherah prophets. Now, very quickly, who is Asherah? Who is this goddess Asherah? Let me tell you. Asherah is a Canaanite goddess of sacred trees, and worship of her was known for its sensuality and prostitution. Some Israelites thought of her as Yahweh's wife, which is very interesting as well. Now, she was the, but, but the focus here is that she was a goddess of sensuality and prostitution. Is sex something that we worship today? The porn industry brings in over $100 billion a year globally. An idol, anything that's an idol, is something that you give yourself over to. That's what idolatry is. Again, the idols today are the same as they were thousands of years ago. The names have changed, but they're the same God, same spirit. Verse 21, then Elijah stood in front of them and said, how much longer will you waver hobbling between two opinions? If the Lord Yahweh is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. Now, here's what a lot of people miss about this story is that a lot of times when we read the story, we think, oh, Israel just abandoned Yahweh, and now they're, they're worshiping Baal and Asherah and these other gods. But that's not exactly and completely true. They still worshiped Yahweh, but they mixed in Baal and Asherah and all these other gods. Because remember, Asherah was seen as Yahweh's wife. So they're like, oh, no, no, we're worshiping Yahweh, but wouldn't it be cooler if God had a wife? And so my point number one, is, if you're following along in your bulletins, is this. Adultery in the church is always born out of the lie that God is not enough. Think about that for all of us. We're all guilty and have been guilty of idolatry, haven't we, of some form or shape of another? There's all, we all have had times in our lives where we've placed other things and given ourselves over to other things instead of God because uh, God, we, in, in, inside, sublimely, we're thinking God's not enough. I believe that Many of us here, if not most of us, if not all of us, probably love Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're a Christian, you probably think, yep, yeah, I love Jesus. But how many other things do we also love? And so we're worshiping Jesus, but we also have these other things that, if we're being honest, we have given ourselves over to. So what are some of our gods today? Here's just a handful of them. We worship Jesus, but we also worship technology. I mean, how many of us have to have the latest phones or the latest car, or a computer, or whatever it may be. Think about this. Can you easily leave your home without your phone? But, like, like I'm, and I'm guilty of this. There have been times where I'm, like, miles on the road. I'm like, ah, I lost my phone. I, mean, I, I forgot my phone. 
and I drive back to my house, and I get my phone, and then I go about my day, because I'm thinking, well, I can't go through my day without my phone, but do I think the same thing, like, have I taken Jesus with me today? Like, have I, am I praying right now? Am I, am I taking him with me, or do I, and I know that Jesus isn't something or someone that we physically take with us, or like we put in our pocket, but do we take him with us wherever we go? Um, would we turn around and go back home? Uh, Ray Kurzweil said this, says that he hopes that, the, he, he says that the hope to save humanity is that he believes that humanity's hope for the future is that we will be able to upload our brains into computers so we can live forever. In other words, I'm, t- I'm telling you, like so many people in the world today are viewing technology as the savior of mankind. We also worship Jesus, but we worship ourselves. Um, we worship Jesus as well as we worship social approval. Social media. The average American spends over two hours a day on social media. That's a lot of time. Are we spending that much time with Jesus? I heard someone say this week, they said uh, that a lot of the mentality that we have in America right now is, I share, therefore I am. In other words, I feel a sense of validation and worth because I shared something about my life and I'm waiting for a response. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong necessarily with sharing things on social media. I'll do it sometimes. All I'm saying is that we have to check our hearts at the door as to why are we sharing what we're sharing. Is it for some sort of validation or affirmation of who we are and what we've done? We worship Jesus, but we also worship money. Not just money, but I would say especially security. In Matthew 6, 24, Jesus said this. This is so key. He said, no one, no one can serve two masters. Since either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, again, you maybe have heard this before, but that Greek word for money is actually mammon. And it doesn't actually mean money. It actually means more like wealth that is meant to secure one's life. That's actually what it means. Or even, and it always has a negative connotation when it's used in Scripture. It's never like, oh, I got some mammon today. It's like, oh, you got mammon. And uh, it's some kind of as unhealthy association as far as how you viewed it. Mammon was literally a god. Uh, Mammon was a Syrian god or the Syrian god of riches. And Mammon has its roots all the way back to Babylon and the Tower of Babel and this idea that we can build this tower to heaven and take care of ourselves. That's where all this comes from. It's this subtle way of thinking that through money, through wealth, I can take care of myself and find security. But it's interesting that Jesus says that you can't serve God and mammon, which means that mammon, or this idea of wealth, is looking for servants. Not just people who like money or what, like wealth. He's looking for people to serve mammon. So I would encourage you that if your life is driven by making sure you and your family are financially secure, mammon could be one of your idols. Sometimes we worship Jesus, but we also worship entertainment. Movies, video games, sports. The Greeks literally had a god named Dionysus, who was the god of theater and wine. It's actually a statue of Dionysus. Now, we also have statues that people worship in our country called the Oscars. And uh, it's like, if you think about it, you ever think about how that looks like? If you look at what like, old idols look like, that's kind of what they look like. And he's holding his sword and... And people, will, they'll, 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 I can't tell you how many millions of people watch the Academy Awards each year, and we lift up these celebrities, these performances, and, and it's, we find almost like a sense of worth uh, coming out of that as well. You know, have we, have we made Netflix or sports our masters? Think about the Lombardi Trophy. I mean, it's, it's all these trophies and a, almost like literal idolatry. Again, I want to make sure I'm saying there's nothing wrong with watching sports. It's just that you, only you know when you, if for you and your heart if it's become lifted up to too high of a place. Many of us who love Jesus deeply have, have given ourselves often too much to these other gods. So my point number two is this, is that the objects of your worship will eventually form your values. We all know this, but Hollywood, is a, uh, Hollywood has its own pulpit. Um, as much as I enjoy a good movie, they're preaching to us ideals and ideologies and morality 
and it's, it gets in there, and it's so subtle. We can say, like, ah, it's okay. I'm just, I can watch that and not have it affect me. But over time, and I've seen it happen, I, over time, it's just like they're preaching and preaching and preaching. And if we're watching movies more than we're in the God's Word, guess what starts to happen? It starts to just get in deep, and then it starts to affect even what we, it says, affects our values. Earlier in 1 Kings 18, Ahab, it's interesting, Ahab talked, there was a famine in the land, and Ahab, this evil king, he basically starts saying like, ah, we got to do whatever we can to make sure we're securing the food and the water so that we can take care of the horses. Not the people, the horses. In other words, his values, he put more value on horses and animals than he did on, on saving people. And the same thing happens today, because I looked it up. We cannot put advertisements on TV anymore about saving children from being killed, but we can put on advertisements about saving dogs. It's the same spirit. According to Elijah and Jesus, both of them, we cannot sit in the fence. We cannot waver and hobble between these two opinions. Do you ever see someone try to stand on a fence, how hard that would be? Or a balance beam, like, or if, I'm terrible at balance beams, but if you were trying to do one, like, imagine trying to, like, dance or something like that on a balance beam, or do anything on a balance beam. We need to pick a side. Jesus said something very sobering in Matthew 12 when he said this, anyone who isn't with me opposes me, and anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. You're either working with Jesus, or you're working against him. Now, just imagine opposing Jesus. Like if he was literally standing here and you're saying, hey, just, Jesus, just you know, I oppose you. Like I would never want to say that out loud, but or do my actions sometimes reflect that? I want to go back to Elijah's challenge again. Verse 21, it says, then Elijah stood in front of them and he said, how much longer will you waver, hobbling between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him, but if Baal is God, then follow him. Do you know what the response was? Here's what it says. But the people were completely silent. Silent. In other words, they didn't say, no, God, you're our God, or no, we want to follow Baal. They're just like, uh, let's just not say anything. And brothers and sisters, I really do feel like this is a, a, a large part in the way that the, the church today is wilting. Is that it's easier to remain neutral and silent than to speak up. It's like we'd like to be France during World War II. You know, just, just remain neutral. Don't, don't say anything. Just see what happens. But that didn't work out for France. I think we can be far too silent, noncommittal. We'd rather say nothing to our friends about Jesus than rather offending them or risking their friendship. But, but what does that communicate about how we feel about Jesus? Because point number three is this. A heart given fully to Jesus cannot remain silent. Here's, here's why. This is one of those ones that's really convicting for me is that silence about the gospel, silence about Jesus is actually disobedience. Because Jesus said in, in Acts 1, he said, when, you know, there is, you know, there's the Great Commission in, in, in the Gospels, but then in Acts, you know, he says, you are to go and I want you to be my witnesses in the world. And a witness is literally someone who speaks, who, who communicates what God has done for them. And so when we stay silent and we don't communicate with the world about what God has done for us, it, it actually is a, is a form of disobedience. And, and that's very convicting to me. We cannot remain silent about what God has done for us. Verse 22, back to our story. It says, Then Elijah said to them, I am the only prophet of the Lord who is left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Now bring two bulls. The prophets of Baal may choose whichever one they wish and cut it into pieces and lay it on the wood of their altar, but without setting fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood on the altar, but not set fire to it. Then call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by setting fire to the wood is the true God. And all the people agreed. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, You go first, for there are many of you. Choose, choose one of the bulls and prepare it, and call on the name of your God. But do not set fire to the wood. So Elijah's setting this challenge, and the prophets of Baal have accepted Again, he's actually playing to Baal's strengths here because what did I say in the beginning is that Baal, one of the things that Baal was seen as the god of was the god of the sun. And so creating fire should be no problem for the god of the sun, right? 
just uh, permit, permit me for a second, for a few minutes here, to just take a little bit of a rabbit trail to talk a little bit more about Baal, because I think this is really fascinating and also very important. Uh, Baal was a Canaanite god. Baal, this is, this is actually an idol of Baal. Baal was also seen, or, or I should say, Baal was also worshipped all the way back in Egypt. The Egyptians took him from the Canaanites, and they, he was incorporated into even Egyptian worship. And then Baal was often depicted holding a lightning bolt. So there was probably a lightning bolt in this hand at one point in time. Uh, but he was usually holding showing a lightning bolt. Does that sound familiar with gods? Because the Greeks actually basically took Baal and converted him into Zeus. Now, I want to look in Matthew, the book of Matthew, after this is a story where Jesus got, just got done driving a demon out of a person. And look what happens here in Matthew 12, 24. It says, when the Pharisees heard about this, him casting this demon out, they said, this man drives out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. So who is Beelzebul? In 2 Kings 1, we're told of a Philistine city, and that city was called Baal-zebub. And the, the, the translation of that town, that city, was the, the lord of the high places, or the lord of the flies. So now continuing on here, it says this in verse 25, it says, Knowing their thoughts, Jesus told them, Every kingdom divided against itself is headed for destruction, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. So that was actually Jesus, not Abraham Lincoln. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons drive them out? And so most theologians agree that, that what Jesus is doing here is that he's basically saying that that. Uh, Beelzebul and Satan are the same thing. In other words, Satan is the spirit behind Beelzebul. And uh, Satan and Beelzebul comes from Baal. It was the city of Baal. And that's where all this is all connected. And so we believe that Satan was the spirit behind Baal, uh, just as he is today. Now here's what's really fascinating is we're connecting these dots. And I kind of just, was really Lord, how the Lord revealed this. In Revelation, 12, uh, Revelation 2, 12 to 13. So this is a vision of the future. Um, Jesus says this in the vision in verse 12. It says, Write this letter to the angel of the church in Pergamum. This is the message from the one with the sharp two-edged sword, Jesus. I know that you live in the city where Satan has his throne, yet you have remained loyal to me. You refuse to deny, deny me even when Antipas, my faithful witness, was martyred among you there in Satan's city. So Satan's city is apparently this city of Pergamum. Well, here's what's really interesting. In the city of Pergamum, there, it was known where people all around the world would come to because there was this giant altar and throne, in a sense, built to Zeus. And, uh, and so, but here's what's also fascinating, is that um, in the late 1800s, people, archaeologists took that temple apart and, uh, and transferred it to somewhere in Europe. Guess where they transferred it to? Germany. And so here's what's fascinating, is that in 1930, this, uh, this altar to Zeus was unveiled finally in it, where it is still today. And you can see it today. Uh, and this is what it looks like. This is an altar to Zeus. And, uh, and so uh, that was revealed in 1930 at this museum. Well, it's amazing, and I, I did a little research, is that in 1929, the, the year before this opened up, the Great Depression hit Germany. And so their economy, their prosperity was wilting, and they were, they were desperate for anything. And so in 1930, the same year that this altar to Zeus was erected and put up for display in Germany, in 1930 was seen as the year of the rise of the Nazi party. Isn't that interesting? And then by, 1930, uh, by 1933, Hitler became chancellor, and in 1934, he became dictator in the, in the city where Satan's throne was now resting. Now, again, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, and I'm not saying for sure that this is all connected. But when I see these kinds of things, like, I do wonder if there's a, there is a, our battle is not against flesh and blood. And there are spiritual rulers and authorities that are, that are all over the world, things happening behind the scenes that we cannot see or understand or comprehend. But I just think it's a little interesting that this throne of Satan, this throne of Zeus, was transported all the way from, from, uh, from Greece all the way to Germany, and it just happens to be unveiled the same year the Nazi party begins to rise to power. Anyway, I just thought that was very interesting, but just keep that in mind as we're doing this, because Baal, again, represents the spirit of Satan. So verse 26, that's important. Verse 26, back to our story. So they prepared one of the bulls and placed it on the altar. 
Then they called on the name of Baal from morning until noontime, shouting, Oh, Baal, answer us. But there was no reply of any kind. It almost makes you wonder if they were expecting a reply. Like, after all, I mean, Satan can communicate. Uh, he has a voice. He has some power. But maybe, I, I, wonder, I wonder if God put a muzzle on him. It says, Then they danced, hobbling around the altar that they had made. Now, this is really a pathetic scene. What's interesting about this is that the, the Hebrew word that, it's actually one word here that means this phrase danced or hobbling, um, it actually doesn't mean danced. No one's doing a ballet or a pirouette around this altar. Not, it's not fancy. They're not doing an interpretive dance. It actually literally means more like wavering. Uh, when, when, and remember when the last time that this verse or this word was used was just a little bit ago when Elijah said to, the, to Israel, he said, how much longer will you waver hobbling between Two opinions. It's the same phrase, the same word. The picture Elijah paints here is of people, again, bouncing on a fence or a, or a um, balance beam. Church, God is calling us to get off the fence. We're all being called to stop wavering and hobbling between two opinions. Again, this is a, a pathetic scene. They're, they're, they're literally like hobbling and limping around this, this worthless idol worship and this, this thing that they're giving their lives to, it's worthless and it's a, it's a pathetic scene. And then next, Elijah offers some holy sarcasm in verse 27. About noontime, Elijah began mocking them. He said, you'll have to shout louder, he scoffed, for surely he is a god. Perhaps he is daydreaming or he's relieving himself or maybe he is away on a trip or is asleep and needs to be awakened. But the Psalms, you know, it says that Yahweh never sleeps. Verse 28, so they shouted louder, and following their normal custom, they cut themselves with knives and swords until their blood gushed out. Again, same spirit behind things that happen today. They raved all afternoon until the time of the evening sacrifice, but there was still no sound, no reply, no response. Then Elijah called to the people, come over here. They all crowded around him. Now, again, this is a nation crowding around uh, Elijah. They all cried around him as he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been torn down. He took 12 stones, one to represent each other, sorry, one to represent each of the tribes of Israel, and he used the stones to rebuild the altar in the name of the Lord. So we'll just stop here a second. This is important. On Mount Carmel, which was Baal's mountain, it used to be Yahweh's. And there was an altar that had been built to Yahweh on this mountain. And Elijah is taking these 12 stones that represent the, the tribes of Israel and rebuilding the altar to the Lord there. I don't know how long this took, but it was worth it to Elijah. And I think there's a symbolism here, isn't there, that for each of us, like our hearts now, we are the temple of the Lord. We, there's an altar of our hearts. And I wonder sometimes when, when we've given ourselves over to other things that we worship and, and other gods and idolatry in our own hearts, that maybe, maybe you're there today. Maybe your heart, there's, a, there's an altar there that, needs, that was there once but it kind of needs to be rebuilt and make space for the Lord, the true God. So who sits in the throne of your heart, so to speak? Ezekiel 14, 4-5 says this. It says, Therefore, speak to them, God's saying. And he says, This is what the sovereign Lord says. When any of the Israelites set up idols in their hearts and put a wicked stumbling block before their faces and then go to a prophet, I, the Lord, will answer them myself in keeping with their great idolatry. But this is so key. I will do this to recapture the hearts of the people of Israel who have all deserted me for their idols. You see, no one accidentally gives themselves to idols. We choose to do this. We, we choose to do this because idolatry is a matter of the heart. It always is. But what's God's resp response to our idol worship? Is that he wants our hearts. He doesn't want to punish us. He wants us to come back to him. He wants our hearts. This is, this is the loving God that he is. He, he desires us. He wants to recapture our hearts, that, that scripture just said. Even if we commit spiritual adultery, he is patient. He is kind. He is loving. He is, he is forgiving. Even though he has every right to abandon us. So let me ask this question and be honest with yourself. It's like, do we as a church, Hopewell as the church, also, do we want revival? Like, do, do we want revival? Like, like answer it in your own in your heart, too, as well. Like, do we want revival? Because here's the key. Do, do we want to be a blessing to the nations? Do we want to bless others? Because it doesn't just happen because we want it. This is where it starts. Jeremiah 4, 
1, 1 to 2. It says this, O Israel, says the Lord, if you wanted to return to me, you could. He says, you could. You could throw away your detestable idols and stray away no more. So I'm, I'm going to continue this passage in a second. So remember, his, his main thing is we're throwing away the idols. There was a time in my life where I realized I had a major idol in my life. I'm being honest with you guys. When I, when I first got, well, when I was a teenager up until even when I got married, my major idol for me was the Philadelphia Eagles. And maybe some of you can relate. It was an idol for me. I can still to this day tell you statistics of Randall Cunningham from the 1990s. And I, I can tell you them afterwards. It's, it's embedded in my brain because I would wake up every morning, look at the newspaper, look at the stats, who did what, what, what place are they in, what's the quarterback rating. I was obsessed with it, and I would never miss a game. And when I realized it was a problem was after I got married, my wife, uh, one of her good friends, was getting married. And she's like, oh, it's the, 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 the wedding's on Sunday at 1 o'clock. And I was kind of like, oh, that's nice. You know, like, well, have fun. And she's like, no, no, you're going with me. I'm like, uh, Maria, there's an Eagles game. And she's like, yeah. I'm like, well, I'm not missing the Eagles game. And, and she's like, yes, you are. And so I very begrudgingly, like, got in the car. I was grumpy, drove to the game. It was a Cowboys game, too. It wasn't just any game. They were just playing the Bengals. Sorry if anybody's a you know, Bengals fan. <laughs> but I, and I'm being honest here. I, I, I was just sitting in the wedding, like, just watching, looking at my watch. Like, there was no internet. I couldn't check the score, right? There's no, 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 uh, no phones where you could check your score. And I'm, like, waiting, waiting, waiting. So the wedding's over. I'm not joking. I ran out to my car turned on the radio to find out what the score was. I was like, okay, okay, we're winning, you know, and I was all excited and stuff, and then I was like, well, and the reception's about to start. I'm like, I'm watching them people walk to, like, the barn, and like, like well, I think it's got five more minutes still, maybe ten minutes, and it, and it hit me. I was like, it, it, it's almost like I was out in a car getting, like, like a drug addict would, like, like, having to get a hit, and I felt so convicted, and I was like, this is really sad, and I, and I, was, like, I was like, my wife didn't have to say anything else anymore, so I was so convicted that we talked about that night and, and uh, about what I felt like the Lord had said to me. And, and so I had to kind of pull way back. And so now to this day, I, I still enjoy sports. I still enjoy watching the Eagles play. But my, w w back then, when they lost, I was depressed the entire week until the next game. It affected everything in my life. And if they won, I was in a great mood. And so I was like, that's not right. And that's not healthy. And I realized it had really become an idol in my life. And I cared way more about the Eagles than I did about Jesus. And so the Lord got me to a place where it's like, now I can watch a game. I would like them to win. And it's a bummer when they lose. But my life doesn't ebb and flow now anymore, whether they win or lose. And so just being honest about that, I had to purge myself of that idol. So what are the idols we have to purge ourselves from? So remember, going back to Jeremiah, he said, get rid of the idols. And then what does God say? It says, then when you swear by my name, saying, as surely as the Lord lives, you could do so with truth justice, and righteousness. And here it is. Then you would be a blessing to the nations of the world, and all people would come and praise my name. So point number four is this, is that Jesus is more easily seen when we make our hearts clean. And I, to be clear, when I'm saying when we make our hearts clean, I'm not talking that we do not make ourselves clean as far as sin. We don't save ourselves. That was done on the cross. What I'm talking about here is that we are purging ourselves and cleaning out, sweeping out the idols of our hearts. Because that's where revival starts. According to God's word, at many different places, that revivals typically start when there is a spark of repentance. When there's, a, when there's a, an earnestness and a desire for us to say, you know what, we don't want any of this stuff anymore, and we're choosing a side. And when we sweep the temples of our hearts out, there will be true and genuine transformation. Like, how many of you want to be transformed more than you are right now? Like, I do. I want to be shining in radiance for Jesus Christ and not just be like a Christian who I hope people see Jesus in me. I want there to be no choice that when I walk into a room, people see Jesus. Because that's how, that's how revival starts. It's not from one person or two or three people in a church. It's from the church collectively saying, we're done with all this garbage and we are all in for Jesus Christ. That's when revival starts. Revival just doesn't just happen because we want it. Revival happens when we make room for it. It, it, it. It's not, we can't demand it of God. We don't say, God, bring revival. That's not how it works. But scripturally speaking, it starts when we're like, God, we need you, less of me, less of all the other things in my life that get in the way. We need people to see Jesus. And this issue of repentance and how that sparks a nation happens here in this story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. So let's go back to that. It says, then... He, Elijah, he dug a trench around the altar large enough to hold about three gallons. He piled wood in the altar, cut bulls into pieces, 
and lay the pieces on the wood. Then he said, fill four large jars with water and pour the water over the offering and the wood. After they had done this, he said, do the same thing again. And when they were finished, he said, now do it a third time. So they did it as he said. And the water ran around the altar and even filled in the trench. So Elijah's basically saying, let's make this as hard as possible for God to do this awesome miracle. Then verse 36. At the usual time for the offering, the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and he prayed. I love this prayer. He said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. Prove that I have done all this at your command. O Lord, answer me. Answer me so that so these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. I want to just look at this prayer because there's some really, there's five really important things in here and aspects of it. First, he acknowledges who God is. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And we need to do it every day of our lives. Acknowledge exactly what, who the God is that we are talking to. And then he says that, um, that I am your servant. He acknowledges who I am. So who is God? Who am I? And then prove that I have done all of this at, at your name. So in other words, he's asking God for something. He's asking God to do something. And he says, oh, Lord, answer me. And then he says, answer me so that these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God. In other words, this is all for God's glory. So when we approach God in prayer and we're asking him for revival, it's like, it's all for your glory, God. It's not for the glory of me or for Hopewell Church or for anything else. It is for God's eternal glory is, is everything that we are desiring. And then here's the key. That you are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. In other words, it all ends with the changing of hearts. Hearts have to be changed. So this is the key. The battleground was not really Mount Carmel. The battleground was the hearts. The battle, there's a battle over your heart today. God desperately wants your heart. He wants you. God loves you more deeply than you even know. But there's a battle for your heart. Verse 38, immediately the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull, the wood, the stones, and the dust. It even licked up all the water in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell face down on the ground and cried out, the Lord, he is God. Yahweh, in other words, the Yahweh he is God. Yes, the Lord is God. I love their response. If you can go back to the previous slide, when it says, they fell face down on the ground. I love that response. Because there have been times in my life where there's such an overwhelming revelation of who God is, who Jesus is in my life, and I just can't help but drop to my knees, drop face down on the ground, and just worship and adoration. It's like, it's like this act of reverence. And like I can't, I'm in God's presence right now. And when I'm confronted with God's presence, it's, 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 I'm, not, I'm not lying down because I feel bad about myself. I'm lying down in his presence or I'm kneeling before God because I'm just so in awe of his love for me and his power and his presence, his holiness. It's all of it. It's all of it wrapped up and together. And I can't help but respond in that way. And so what I want to do today is that we, we want to just end our time together with a little bit of extended time. So this is, all part of our, this is all part of our worship time, is that I want us to spend some time in God's presence. He may not throw lightning down on, on us. We're, pray, we're praying. But do you believe that God is here? Like we, we, we say that, like, oh, God is here. But do we really believe that? Like, is, is he here today? Is he in this room today? hundred percent. And so what I would like us to do is I would like us to posture our hearts during this time. We're going to be singing some songs, but I want us to posture our hearts collectively as a church, um, that we are coming before the living God who loves us, who has compassion for us. But what I would like us to do, though, is I would like us to approach him in in an act of humility and say, uh, God, here's my heart. And, And I'm also cleansing myself of the idol's and the, the adultery in my heart 
Because, th- look, th- we're being, can we just be honest, right? We're, we're all there, right? There, all of us have probably something in our hearts. Maybe it's your children that you worship too much. Maybe it's your job. I, I mean, you fill in the blank. We all have our thing. There's these things that we can place in our hearts uh, too high ahead of God. And so what I want to encourage us to do is, like, let's use this sacred time and space. This is holy ground, so to speak. And I want us to present our hearts to the Lord, if you could. I am not telling you what you should or shouldn't do or how you want to do this. So, so the one thing I would ask, though, if we could do as a people, as a people of God, is that, that we, we worship the Lord. You can stand. You can sit. You can kneel. If you want to come up and just be in this space right here at the altar, um, as, you know, whatever you want to do is to say, like, you know, I'm going to take a step. I'm going to get off the fence, and, I'm, and I want to come up front here, and I want to show God right now that I'm done with the idols in my heart. I'm going to come down here. I want to be down here in this space because this is where I need to be. And so I understand it's an act of humility to do that. Um, but if we collectively do it together, if you want to come up here and sit, stand, kneel, you want to lie down on your face, there's no judgment. It's okay. We, we carpeted this. We, we vacuumed this week. Um, but, but this is your time, your space. There's no religious spirit here. There's no like, well, you have to stand or you have to kneel or you have to do This is your time and space with you and God. And so we're going to sing a couple songs here. And as we do this, I just encourage you, just close your eyes if you know the words. And just give yourself over to God, like the one who loves you more than anyone. So let's, let's worship him. Maybe if we could all like, maybe start out standing together, and then uh, after that, just go ahead and do what you want to do. If you want to walk down here and just fill, fill in the front here as a space and just get off the fence. Let's stop wavering and worshiping Jesus and all these other things, and let's just give our hearts to Jesus. So. Open our eyes to you, Lord. For 
your glory, for your honor, for you alone. You alone are the living God. This morning we declare that, Lord. Set us free. Chains fall. Everything lies healed, hope found here now. Jesus, you change everything. Chase found.
church, pray for those around you. Pray for those up front. Pray for those that are seeking Jesus. If you're not sure what to do right now, pray. Pray for the people around you right now. The mountains shake before you. The demons run and flee. At the mention of your name, King of Majesty, there is no power in hell or any who can stand. us. And Father, I just ask that by your spirit, Lord, that you would just keep moving in each of our hearts right now. Lord, we confess with our mouths, with our hearts, uh, all those areas that we have given over to other things. Things that are not of you, things that do not glorify you, things that we have put dependence in besides you, God. And we just, we confess with our hearts and our minds and our mouths, Lord, that we are sorry for doing that. We are sorry for elevating things above you in our lives. And Lord, I pray right now that we would, every one of us, enter into a new territory today, that we would stop wavering on the fence, that we would choose a side, and we are today choosing the side of the one who died for us, the one who made a way for us, the one who created us. Only you, Jesus, are the lover of our souls. And so today we choose you, Jesus. Lord, if this, and if this is your first time here today and you've, 
never chosen Jesus, I pray that today would be that day for you and that you would choose Jesus for the first time. God, we thank you that you have loved us first. You love us even when we make mistakes. You love us even when we've chosen other things here and there. But God, I pray that we as a church would choose you, that we would set aside the things in this world that we've elevated above you. Lord, thank you that you are compassionate, that you are kind, that you have shown us your loving kindness, Lord. And we receive it right now, God. And I pray that you would awaken in each one of us that fire, Lord, just like you sent that fire on the altar. Lord, I pray that you would set a fire right now in the altar of every one of our hearts, Lord. That we could not help but burn for you. Holy Spirit, you are a fire. You are a consuming fire. Burn out, burn away all the things that would take us from your heart, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would bring revival. And we do not ask that lightly, Lord. We do ask that you would bring revival and that you would bring about that spirit of repentance, that spirit of longing for the things of you and less of the world. I'm reminded of what John the Baptist said. He said, more of you and less of me. May that be our heart's cry, Lord. More of you and less of me. Thank you for your love for us, Jesus. God on the cross, you gave us the keys to freedom. And so, Lord, we receive it right now. We receive from you that freedom, especially for those of us just really feel like right now, like those, there are people here who know there's an idol in their lives, but they feel like that idol is their master. And so, Lord, I ask right now, Lord, that the, the finished work of the cross that has already been done, you've already won that battle, God. And so I just pray that right now that every person who feels like they are a slave, they've given themselves over to that master or, the, or over to those things that are ruling their lives right now. Lord, I pray right now, we ask this as brothers and sisters in Christ, that you would bring freedom in this place, in this church body to everyone who feels like they are a slave to something, Lord. God, that is not the best that you have for us, Lord. You desire us to have complete and total freedom. And so we ask this right now in Jesus' name that you would bring about complete freedom in all of our hearts, God. Bring freedom, Lord. Bring freedom so that we can freely worship, freely live, freely love our spouses, freely love our children, freely love ourselves. God, thank you for your freedom. You've already won it. May we receive it, God. Mm, thank you, Lord. The mountains shake before you, and the demons run and flee at the power of the name, King of Majesty. Nothing can stand against you in your presence, Lord. And so I pray that every idol in our hearts right now will just come crashing to the ground. Every spirit that we've set up against you will come crashing to the ground, Jesus. Lord Jesus, we are yours. We belong to you. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. You are good, and your love endures forever.